Hi, and welcome to Behind the Cloud, the show where we talk about the people and technologies that actually make the enterprise cloud happen. My name is David Clark, and I rejoice in the title of Senior Vice President of Technology Development at Workday. I'm delighted to be joined today by Barbara Cosgrove. Welcome, Barbara. Thank you, David. Who is Workday's Chief Privacy Officer. And Barbara, just to get the really difficult question out of the way first, is it privacy or privacy? I would say you say privacy, I say privacy. Okay, let's call it privacy. So maybe before we get into that, um, can you tell me a little bit about what you do as the Chief Privacy Officer at Workday? Sure. I've been with Workday for almost 11 years now. Is the company that old? <laughs> it is. And I lead our global privacy, ethics, and compliance team. So from a global data privacy perspective, my team's responsible for implementing the policies, procedures we have in place to protect personal data and partnering with our product organization to build privacy into the product. Mm -hmm. We also oversee our third-party compliance programs, so that would be our certifications, our SOC audits, ISO, to make sure that we have the controls in place that our customers can rely on our privacy and security controls. Mm -hmm. Is privacy fun? I think privacy is fun. OK, well, that's good. So we're here today to talk about GDPR, or the General Data Protection Regulations. Sure. GDPR is a new regulation that's intended to harmonize the existing uh, European Data Protection Directive, which was implemented differently in each member state. So as opposed to having country by country data privacy regulations or laws, we'll now have one consistent approach to data privacy across all of the European Union. So that makes it easier in theory to comply. It makes it easier to have one program that would comply with uh, the regulations across Europe, yes. Mm -hmm. And when we talked about this earlier, you were saying there's a lot of different sub-elements to this, the right to be forgotten, the right to be audited. But I guess there's a couple of broad principles that, that drive a lot of the thinking behind the regulations. Maybe you could talk about what they are. Sure. When I, when I talk about GDPR, the, the first main principle is accountability. So when you look at it, it's really understanding how a company is going to be able to demonstrate compliance. So how does a third party know that you're doing what you say you do, that you have a program in place that can monitor compliance and demonstrate that you're doing the right thing? The second part is really making sure that you're being transparent about what you do. So that companies have updated their policies in terms of providing notice, in terms of how data is used, what data is collected, and doing so in a way that anybody can understand, that it's not all legalese buried in terms, that it's just very clear explanations of here's the data I'm collecting, here's examples of how we use it that anybody could understand. Mm -hmm. And to whom does this regulation apply? It's going to apply to really any company, anybody that's collecting European personal data. So in the past, many US companies or companies that are in Asia Pacific may not have had to comply with the European regulations because they weren't situated there. Now, if you're going to be collecting, processing European personal data, you're going to be subject to this regulation. Mm -hmm. So that potentially changes things for many companies. And historically, companies have been able to transfer data internationally and specifically between the EU and the US under the auspices of the, um, the Privacy Shield or previously the Safe Harbor provisions. So does GDPR change that? No, GDPR allows for the cross-border data transfer mechanisms to continue. So Privacy Shield, standard contractual clauses, binding corporate rules will all continue to exist after GDPR's effective date. But it also looks forward to additional mechanisms coming into place, so potential certifications um, or codes of conduct. So we've been involved in some codes of conduct initiatives where a company could implement a code of conduct and demonstrate that you have consistent processes for handling the data, and that might be a new mechanism to allow for cross-border data transfer. Do you think that some of these principles could be adopted by the US? So should the US just adopt GDPR? That's an interesting question. So the US does have privacy regulations in place already. They're just industry specific. So there's HIPAA for healthcare data, COPPA for children, GLBA for financial data. And then many states have also implemented strong privacy protections, California being one of them. Um, but they don't align one-on-one -on -one with GDPR. So I think it, it would be a good thing if we could implement uh, regulation that was very similar so that you could have one one set of policies practices across across your entire program at a global level mm -hmm. and talking about regulatory skew and, and global applicability is the Asia Pacific region also making progress or, or introducing new regulations in this arena 
Sure, that's that's one of the interesting things to me is we, we talk a lot about GDPR right now as the due date comes up, the effective date. However, over the last two years, we've seen many new regulations come up throughout Asia. Um, so Japan has a new data privacy law, um, and it will be, I'm hopeful that those will be harmonized with GDPR so that you can look looking forward, have one way to transfer data globally and uh, one set of compliance mechanisms. Mm -hmm. I guess one small query as it relates to Europe, if Britain does actually end up getting its act together and managing to leave the European Union, will that affect Britain's participation in these regulations? It could going forward. As of the effective date, um, Britain will still be part of the European Union and has a plan in place for compliance with GDPR. Um, however, post-Brexit, it will be interesting to see whether the uh, European Union grants uh, Britain adequacy. Mm -hmm. And so it says that they have an adequate data protection program mm -hmm. um, for processing European personal data. If not, um, there will have to be a uh, mechanism like Privacy Shield mm -hmm. um, put in place there. Mm -hmm. um, so. Speaking about the effectiveness, the effective date, um, May 25th, other than being Sir Ian McKellen's birthday, is also the date on which these regulations become effective. So um, is, that a, is that a start date? Is it an end date? What, what is May 25th? Sure. Um, it's going to be a start date. So I, I don't look at May 25th as a deadline. It's really going to be the beginning of a new privacy regime. Um, but there's going to be additional changes coming after that. There's going to be additional guidances, um, more interpretations of how to comply. But to help focus people's minds, albeit it's only a start date, the fines which are substantial become effective potentially from that date, right? They do. They, they are much different than under the, the directive. Um, in the past, the data protection authorities in certain countries had pretty limited ability to, to fine companies for data protection violations. With GDPR, um, the penalties can be very large, up to 4% of a company's annual turnover um, or up to 20 million euro. Do the regulations apply equally to consumer-facing companies and to enterprises that are B2B? They do. Uh, they, they don't differentiate for industry or for type of company in terms of their applicability, but there are differences in terms of what you'll do to comply. So mm -hmm. a consumer company is going to be much more focused in terms of their interactions with their end users, in terms of providing notice, getting consent on data, where a B2B company is going to have to be acting in accordance with its contracts with its customers and being um, having the processes in place to support them in terms of things like right to be forgotten, which you referenced earlier, making sure that they have the ability to delete personal data as needed mm -hmm. or the uh, ability to have insight into the security measures that the data processor would have for a mm -hmm. B2B company. What is your sense of the general level of preparedness? Um, I, given that this is just a start date still, what is the preparedness level? Sure. Um, I think it depends on the size of company and how much European personal data that they process. Um, it also depends on the level of maturity that their privacy program already had. If it's a large global company, they most likely already had policies, processes in place, compliance mechanisms. And so it was really going through and making sure that they've they've done reviews, that they've done some adjustments, as opposed to having to build it from the, from the start. Uh, but I, I do think there's a very high level of awareness of GDPR. And if a company were to come to you today um, looking slightly panicked and saying, we haven't done anything yet, <laughs> um, where should they start? Um, I think in that case, I'd be handing them a, a card to an outside law firm or consulting firm to get help quickly. Uh, but hopefully, they have a program in place that they can already look at. And um, I would be starting in terms of looking at my data inventory. Uh, do I understand where I'm collecting personal data, where I've stored personal data, and um, how I've gotten consent for that personal data, as well as the security measures around it? Do you have advice for companies who are further along in the journey? Maybe should they just keep doing what they're doing? and? be better at it? Or is, like, is there anything companies need to do very differently if they already have a reasonably competent set of capabilities around data protection? For a more mature company, you're still going to have to go through and make sure that you're updating your training and awareness materials, that you're reviewing your privacy notices and practices to make sure that they're really easy to understand. Um, reviewing any sub-processors that you're using, third parties, to make sure that you have the appropriate contractual terms with them, um, as well as that you have oversight into their practices. But I think for those companies, it's also just critical to be engaging with industry groups and your peers and, and learning what you're sharing knowledge. Mm -hmm. So obviously, we try and avoid commercials in the show here. But um, 
I take it the workday system, well, I know the workday system can help um, companies with these kinds of programs. So maybe you can give us a flavor for a couple of the capabilities that, that enable that. Sure. There, I, I would look at it two different ways. First, it's Workday as a data processor. So our customers need to have assurance that we're doing the right thing with the personal data so they can talk to their regulators, their workers' councils, their employees. And with that, they can look at our third-party audit reports. We invest a lot into our third-party compliance reports, so making sure that they cover data privacy as well as security. And we've um, made some enhancements so that they can actually map them directly to the GDPR obligations. The second is looking at the product itself and making sure that they're taking advantage of the configurable security within the product to tighten up perhaps uh, some access they might need to look at for data. Um, and then also using our purging capabilities so that they can delete um, data. For example, if a former worker uh, submits a right to be forgotten request, a right to please delete all my data, that they're using our, mm -hmm. our product functionality for things like that too. Okay. Great, makes sense. So to pivot slightly onto the um, skills and capabilities that companies and individuals will need to prosper mm -hmm. um, in, this, in this new regime, um, this, a lot of new responsibilities are being created. There is specifically this new concept of a data privacy officer. Maybe you could talk a little bit about the, the, the skills and the kinds of roles that are, that are going to become more prevalent in this new regime. Sure. So the data protection officer is a new role for many companies um, uh, that you'll need to have um, that will have typically more of a compliance data privacy background and will be able to provide an oversight function. So if a company has a question in terms of whether they're processing data in compliance with GDPR, if they're going through and conducting privacy impact assessments and have a risk identified, they'll be consulting with their internal data protection officer who has an obligation to also consult with the regulatory authorities. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that, that will be a new role, but we also, I, I think a lot of companies will continue to invest in their privacy operations programs too. So you'll continue to see privacy specialists join the company and become embedded in different areas within the company. So many companies um, operate in a certain way today and potentially that mode of operation will be significantly affected by some of these new regulations. So how do you think companies should strike this balance between you know, fully respecting the privacy requirements envisaged by GDPR and then continuing to operate the business in the way that they need to operate the business? There shouldn't necessarily be a conflict. A company should be able to still process personal data. It's just being transparent about how you're using it, making sure that you've told people what data you're collecting, um, that you've outlined how you're using that data. But it doesn't put an end to the use of data. It's just really being upfront about how mm -hmm. it's being used. Okay. But it'll be interesting to see how those come together in innovation with privacy. Yeah, because there's a, a particular intersection with machine learning techniques where potentially aggregated data sets may be anonymized or being used to help train algorithms. And is it clear how that interaction is going to play out? Is that still something that can be done? Again, I think it depends in terms of did the company have the right to use the data for that purpose? Is the data going to be anonymized? Is it going to be pseudonymized? Mm -hmm. Is it really personal data at mm -hmm. that point? And then is it being used to create automatic decision making on individuals where there might need to be additional consent and additional rights? Or is it being used um, perhaps for purposes like security? Mm -hmm. So, But I do think there will be many more discussions in terms of machine learning and GDPR and privacy coming. Mm -hmm. So it should be possible to do it, but it just needs to be done more thoughtfully, I guess. It needs to be done thoughtfully, transparently, and we'll need to um, continue to look at how the, again, the anonymous versus pseudonymous comes together. Okay. I'm not even going to try to spell that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just, just to wrap up, um, it's been a very informative discussion, so thanks for coming in today. Um, but obviously, May 25th is a big date, so what are you and the privacy team planning to mark the occasion? Well, we will be doing a lot of awareness activities. <gasps> Many trainings will be coming your way, David. So look look forward to some, some data privacy that week. No party or even a party at an undisclosed location or no? <laughs> we, we do plan on having treats at some of the, the trainings, so. <laughs> okay, you heard it here first. Well, thank you, Barbara. I enjoyed the conversation. So now I think everybody knows what they're going to be doing on May 25th, a big day in the history of privacy. <laughs> <laughs> And with that, uh, that's us signing off from Behind the Cloud. <laughs>